Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 246 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Summer is here, and it's a time that many people relish. They enjoy the warm weather, spending time on the beach, and personally, I enjoy the seasonal excuse to eat fried clams. For many, summer is also a time to slow down and enjoy a vacation, possibly even a good long road trip. You know, speaking of road trips, my parents took my brother and I on lots of road trips when we were kids. Sometimes we'd set out in our car from New Hampshire and drive south, west, and north. Other times we'd fly into a distant area of the United States and then drive around for a week or so so we could see new things. And in grad school, I even had the opportunity to drive entirely across the country, from New Hampshire to California. And that was a fun trip. Tim and I took a month to do it, and we saw so many sights along the way. So I speak from experience when I say that road trips can be a lot of fun. They're a chance to see new places, experience new and different American cultures, and a chance to take in new and different American histories. That's why over the next four episodes, we're going to take a road trip together, right through Ben Franklin's world. We'll cover 737 miles, or 1,186 kilometers, as we revisit four historic sites from Montreal, Quebec, to Charlottesville, Virginia. Now, I've designed this road trip series to provide you with a fun and doable map for a real-life road trip. Plus, it gives us an excuse to call attention to some of our great early episodes, which in turn creates time for me and my teammates to enjoy our summer vacations and to prepare some exciting new episodes for you, including our 250th episode. Can you believe it? We're almost at episode 250. And when we reach episode 250, that's when Ben Franklin's World will come back with all new interviews. Okay, so our road trip. Our starting point is the Museum Chateau de Ramazé in Montreal, Quebec. We first visited this site back in episode 41 in 2015. It was part of a short series on the causes and effects of the American Revolution. The Chateau is a really interesting place. It's on UNESCO's 1001 Historic Sites Everyone Should See because of its interesting history. Now, I visited this museum in person. It was part of our French and Indian War Tour cruise. And I can verify that this museum is well worth a visit. So what are we waiting for? We should get this road trip underway and make our way to the Chateau de Ramsey and our conversation with Bruno Paul Stenson. Today, we sit down with Bruno Paul Stenson, an historian and musicologist who works at the Chateau de Ramazé, a museum and historic site of Montreal. In collaboration with UNESCO, experts selected the Chateau Ramazé as one of the thousand and one historic sites you must see before you die. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Bruno, or should I say, bienvenue? Well, thank you very much, or should I say, merci? <laughs> We are excited to have you join us today so we can investigate some of the history of New France. It is really difficult for us to understand colonial North America, the four imperial wars fought here, and the American Revolution without understanding a bit about the colony of New France and its tension-filled relationship with its British colonial neighbors to the south. So thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Before we dive into the history of New France, would you tell us a bit about yourself, the types of work you do for the Chateau Ramsay, and perhaps what a musicologist is? Well, a musicologist is somebody who studies the geography of music or the sociology of music or the technology of music. In fact, any aspect of music at all without necessarily being a musician or even studying the music itself. My particular interest in this field is the history of musical instruments, of which I own and play about 250 different types from around the world and all through time. Wow. I've always been interested in music and also always been interested in history. Indeed, two of my four university degrees are in history, and my long-lasting volunteer position uh, so far Uh, has been guiding at the Chateau Ramsay Museum, which is a history museum in old Montreal. When the director found out about my musical talent and instrument collection, he hired me right away to present 18th century music 
in 18th century costume on my 18th century musical instruments. Wow, that sounds like a really fun job. It really is cool, because I also get to do special thematic tours and school tours at the, the museum, and I've been on the guide's board of directors. I'm now a member of the guide training team, so I, I do a whole lot of things at the Chateau Ramsay Museum. It's actually quite amazing what you can do when you have no social life. <laughs> Before we talk about the Chateau, would you help us brush up on our colonial American history? Would you provide us with a brief overview of how, when, and why the French settled New France? Oh, the French were the johnny come latelys of North American exploration during the early Renaissance, which is a, a bit of a surprise when you consider that by many measures, France was the dominant power in Europe at the time. The Spanish, the Portuguese, the English were all quick off the mark in exploring and claiming land in the Americas after Christopher Columbus got flummoxed by the Caribbean in his attempt to go east by going west in 1492. But it wasn't until 1534 that Jacques Cartier was sent to the New World by French King Francois I, who famously reasoned, I would like to see the clause in Adam's will that excludes me from sharing in this world. Until then, the French presence in North America had been limited to fishing off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. Now, when Cartier got here, everything south of present-day Canada was already claimed by other European powers. So Francois's sharing in this world ended up meaning that France took possession of the land along the St. Lawrence River, which the French called Canada, land to the east of that, which they called Acadie, or Acadia, and then land down the middle of the continent from the Great Lakes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, between land claimed by England to the east and Spain to the west. And the French called that land Louisiane, or Louisiana. Successful permanent settlement only began at Quebec, in 1608, one year after Jamestown, Virginia. The reason for staying in the New World is given very succinctly in a document prepared in 1717 for the French minister in charge of the colonies. The very first sentence of the document says, the beaver trade is almost the only objective of the French colony of Canada. The other important objective was converting the locals to Roman Catholicism. But everything else going on in this colony was subservient to and in support of the fur trade. What types of people settled in New France? Could you be a Protestant and settle in New France? What kind of work and background did the colonists have? Cardinal Richelieu made it quite clear. Now, Cardinal Richelieu was the prime minister of the King of France. And he made it quite clear. New France was to be a Catholic colony. So the people who settled here could only be Catholics. But it was the Protestants who attempted to establish a colony here between Jacques Cartier's exploration and Samuel de Champlain's founding of Quebec. So Cardinal Richelieu recognized the importance of the Protestants. So he allowed Protestants to work here, but they were not allowed to settle. And settling meant spending the winter. Because in winter, the St. Lawrence River froze solid. If you were here, once the river had begun to freeze, you could not leave. You had therefore settled. So it's Catholics who could settle, Protestants who could work here, but obviously only between mid-spring and early autumn. And Jews were simply banned from the colony entirely. When did the French found Montreal, and what role did that city play in the settlement of New France? Montreal, or Ville-Marie de Montréal, as it was known then, was founded in 1642 on the island of Montreal, which itself is named in a roundabout way after the bump in the middle of the island called Mont Royal, or Mount Royal. Now, that little bump was named by Jacques Cartier, who was from a country that has the Alps. 
So there's no way Cartier could look at Mount Royal and think, it's big, it's royal, it's important. No, the real story is actually more amusing. You see, one of his ship officers was the nephew of a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church in Sicily. And the seat of the bishopric was in Monreale, in northern Sicily. Cartier was sucking up to the bishop by naming the mountain and island after his bishopric. So it's got nothing to do with the mountain actually looking royal in any way. Be that as it may, Montreal was founded in 1642 by Paul de Chomedy, Sieur de Maisonneuve, and he intended the city to be an evangelical station with the goal of converting the Amerindians who had long been coming to the island of Montreal on a regular basis for trade, the island being located at the confluence of rivers leading to the northwest, to the Great Lakes, and to the northeast. That the Amerindian trade already involved furs rather quickly inspired de Maisonneuve and friends to convert Montreal from an evangelical station to a commercial fur trade station. And as such, while Quebec remained the political capital of the colony, Montreal became the economic capital of the colony. Let's talk about the Amerindian peoples who lived around and came and visited Montreal. What kind of relationship did they have with the settlers of Montreal and New France? Oh, a year after founding Quebec City, Samuel de Champlain set the pattern of relationships between the French and the natives in 1609 to support the Hurons from the Great Lakes with whom he was trading and who were at war against the Iroquois. Champlain went to war against the Iroquois as well. This war went on until the Great Peace of 1701. So this is a a war against the Iroquois that lasted almost a century. And sadly, when you read the treaty, it really turns out to have been not the Great Peace, but the Great Surrender of the Technologically Wanting. So with peoples to the west and north of the St. Lawrence, the Hurons and the Algonquians, the French had uninterrupted amicable relations. But with people to the south, the Iroquoians, they had hostile relations at the beginning, followed by a very uneasy peace. What was the nature of their hostile relations? Is it because the French moved in and took over their lands? Were they seen as a threat? Were there just poor trading relationships? It's largely because the French were trading with the Hurons, who lived farther north than did the Iroquoians. The farther north you go on the continent, the more beavers you're going to find. And the beaver was the prime fur that these people, the the French, were looking for. So the Hurons had more furs. The Iroquois were trading with the English and rapidly running out of fur. So the Iroquois were at war against the Hurons to get the Hurons' fur supply. So the French were basically involved in an economic war between their trading partners and their trading partners' enemies. Let's shift the conversation a bit and get more into the history of the Chateau Ramsay Who was Claude de Ramsay, and why did he decide to build the chateau? At that time, Canada, the part of New France along the St. Lawrence River, was divided into three administrative regions, each centered on one of Canada's three cities, Quebec, Montréal, and halfway between them along the St. Lawrence, Trois-Rivières. Canada as a whole had a governor general. Each of the three city-centered administrative regions also had its own governor. Claude de Ramsay was appointed governor of Montreal and the surrounding region in 1704. The French king, Louis XIII at the time, was too cheap to pay for housing and offices for his colonial governors, so Ramsay was forced to pay for his own. Uh, Sort of. Back then, a stone house would cost 450 livres minimum. That's roughly $20,000 in 
today's currency. An expensive stone house could cost up to 2,000 livres, or about $90,000 in today's currency. Well, Claude de Ramsey, being the representative of the king, had to look the part, so he borrowed 3,400 livres, some $160,000 in today's currency, and he borrowed this from the Franciscan brothers to pay for his builder. He described his stone house as the finest in all of Canada, and he never repaid the Franciscans. Ramsey remained governor of Montreal until his death in 1724. His widow, Marie-Charlotte Denis de la Ronde, who bore Ramsey's 16 children, outlived him by 20 years. And when she died, their daughter, Françoise Louise, a lumber baron, by the way, sold the house. What did the house look like? How was he having it furnished? And, and how big was it? It seems like, you know, 3,000 livres is a lot of money to spend on a house in the colonies. The house was then smaller than it is now. There was a, a minor fire in the house that prompted the, uh, the new owners to expand the house, both in width and in depth. But it was a stone house with a high, steeply pitched roof, as was the fashion then in Europe. The house contained living quarters for himself, his large family, a large contingent of servants, and it also contained offices and other rooms for his official business because the house was not only for living in, it was also the offices of the governor. So just picture a largish stone house in a city composed mainly of wooden houses. And you can get some idea of why Ramsey was under the illusion that it was the finest in all of Canada. That was actually going to be my next question. Now that we have a great picture of what this house looked like, what sort of context did he build it in? What did Montreal look like when de Ramsey arrived? Montreal was what I like to call a five by 20 minute city. It was a fortified city with a 25 foot high stone wall surrounding it. And because the city was built on a long, thin hillock running parallel to the St. Lawrence River, it ended up being a long, thin city. Walking from the north wall to the south wall across the city took about five minutes. Walking from the east wall through the city all the way to the west wall was about a 20-minute walk. Most of the houses, as I said, were made of wood. Homes of the elite on Notre Dame Street, which runs all along the, the crest of this hillock, were made of stone. And it's in the east end of that street that Ramsey built his house. The other major east-west artery close to the river is St. Paul Street, which still exists, as does Notre Dame Street still today. And this is where the merchants set up their homes and shops, the idea being to be closer to the St. Lawrence River because it's by river traffic that they received their goods and shipped their goods. So they had an interest in being as close to the river as possible. Now, in the middle of Notre Dame Street, and I do mean smack dab in the middle of the road, was Notre Dame Church. There was no way for someone visiting Montreal to claim that their absence from Sunday Mass was because they did not know where the church was. They literally had to walk around it as they went along the main street. Religion in the colony was omnipresent. The administrators of the island of Montreal were the Sulpician Order, whose seminary remains on Notre Dame Street to this day. The central part of this seminary is the oldest standing building in Montreal. The Jesuits were also on Notre Dame Street, right across from where Ramsey built his house. The hospital at the time was run by the Hospitaller Brothers, or Charon Brothers, whose facilities were taken over by the Grey Nuns when the brothers went bankrupt. The major changes that occurred to this city over uh, time through the French uh, period were brought about by fires, which ravaged Montreal on a semi-regular basis, including the fire of 1721 during Ramsey's governorship, 
In this fire, 138 buildings were partially or totally destroyed. Montreal would remain this 5 by 20 minute city officially until the end of the 19th century. Suburbs had grown up around the city of Montreal, this walled city, and Montreal started gobbling up its suburbs, thereby expanding what was officially called Montreal, but only from the end of the 19th century onward. Earlier, you mentioned that Montreal was really the economic capital of New France. I wonder if you could tell us how the, and I'm going to apologize for mispronouncing this, but the Compagnie de Indes ended up occupying the chateau between 1745 and 1760. And of course, they're the French company of the Indies. The Compagnie des Indes Occidentales ended up owning the, the Chateau Ramsay. You see, in New France, Everything belonged to the king of France. Every drop of water, every blade of grass, every everything, including the beavers, the main reason for the French being there. Now, because the king could not personally run every aspect of the colony, a company was set up to run the fur trade. And that was the Compagnie des Indes Occidentales, or the West Indies Company. It's this company that bought the Ramsay House, from their lumber baron daughter in 1745. They used it as their North American headquarters, their corporate headquarters being in the uh, French West Coast port of Nantes. And it's the Compagnie des Indes that expanded the chateau when they repaired the damage left by the fire in 1755. In addition to dealing in furs from Canada, the Compagnie des Indes Occidentales dealt in sugarcane from the Caribbean, and slaves from Africa. This was referred to as the triangular trade. Uh, they would bring goods from one area to the next, pick up whatever they were working on in that area, bring it to the next one, and so on in, uh, in a triangle. When the British took over New France at the end of the Seven Years' War, the Compagnie des Indes Occidentales obviously lost their fur trading rights in Canada, and they lost their access to the Chateau Ramsay. So they reorganized and became history's biggest slave trading company. Wow. Do you know how many slaves they would have traded in a year to make them the biggest? Well, we're looking at hundreds of thousands. Wow. Now, by 1775, the Chateau had come to play a role in the American Revolution. In 1775, the American rebels launched an offensive into Canada with the hope that they would prevent a British attack on the 13 colonies coming from Canada. What role did the Chateau Ramsay play during the American occupation of Montreal between 1775 and 1776? Well, the revolutionaries didn't so much want to prevent an attack from the north as incorporate the new British colony into their Republican project. By 1775, the Chateau Ramsay was serving as the office of the British governor of the former New France. When the Continental Army entered Montreal on November 12, 1775, they made a beeline for the Chateau Ramsay and used it as their headquarters until they left in the spring of 1776. Now, you mentioned that the Americans wanted to incorporate Quebec and Canada into their revolutionary experiment. How did the men and women of Montreal and Quebec feel about the American Revolution? Well, we have to bear in mind that by some estimates, only 20% of the American population supported the American Revolution. So it should come as no surprise that the majority of the population in Canada was also against the revolution. The elite here was against the invaders, but as is always the case in such situations, there was a rebellious element largely among the youth who supported the revolution. But that enthusiasm did not last long. When Richard Montgomery entered Montreal without facing any resistance, he quickly understood that British Governor Guy Carleton had left the city with all of its military to reinforce Quebec City against an attack by Benedict Arnold and his troops. So Montgomery left for Quebec City with about half of his forces, leaving Major David Wooster in charge at Montreal. Wooster, sadly, was not the sharpest bayonet on the muskets. 
he jailed the leading citizens, closed the churches, and in December, possibly his most brilliant move, he forbade midnight mass. And to these mistakes, which clearly placed the population against them, we have to add the fact that the Continental Army was spreading smallpox among the population. So with all of this, Montrealers turned against the revolutionary. Also, having only Continental script in their pockets, the Americans were unable to pay for food and lodging because the locals did not recognize or trust that currency. This forced the Americans to raid farms for food, and it forced them to impose themselves upon the farmers in the, their farmhouses for lodging. So people in the countryside turned against them. And, of course, at Quebec City, well, there was the siege by the combined forces of Richard Montgomery and Benedict Arnold. So the people at Quebec City failed to rally to support the revolutionaries. Incidentally, the attack on Quebec City was the product of what can easily be described as the most idiotic battle plan ever devised. The Americans were not a formal army. There were some military, legitimate military within their ranks, but mostly they were militiamen. These were part-time contract soldiers whose contracts were to expire on January 1st, 1776, and we're already in November when they enter Montreal. Many of these militiamen were suffering from smallpox and pneumonia. They ended up eating their boot leather, cartridge boxes, and their dog, a Newfoundland, by the way, just in case you're curious. Their battle plan? Wait for the first snowy night so they could attack Quebec City in darkness and be hidden by the snow. Well, that first snowy night only came in the night of December 30th to 31st, a day and a half before the militiamen's contracts were due to expire. To make sure they could recognize each other in the dark, in the snow, the Americans put hemlock twigs in their hat. I don't know if you've ever been out on a dark, snowy night, but there's no way you can see a hemlock twig in anybody's hat. Montgomery and most of his officers were shot dead in the first volley at two in the morning, largely because Montgomery got the whole proceeding started by yelling at the top of his lungs, boys, Quebec is ours. And that, of course, just told the Canadians where to aim and shoot. Arnold was just at the other end of Quebec City waiting to hear musket fire to know that he should also begin his assault. And he was almost immediately shot, as memory serves, he was shot in the leg. That put him out of commission. And his troops ended up surrendering by 9 a.m. So the whole thing lasted about seven hours and resulted in 20 British casualties and 100 American casualties, some of whom were not found until the following spring because of the snowstorm that they decided to stage the attack in. So whatever goodwill the Americans might have found upon their arrival in Canada quickly turned to animosity all across the territory, and that prompted a call for diplomats to come up to Montreal and try their hand at getting support from Canada. Yeah, I mean, I've read some of the correspondence between General Schuyler, who was technically the American in charge of the invasion to the Continental Congress. And Schuyler was like, we don't have enough supplies. I don't want to really launch this attack. And Continental Congress is, you will invade Canada. They really wanted to add Canada to their rebellion. And as you've mentioned, it really was fraught. But that didn't stop the Continental Congress from really trying to make a diplomatic case and try to turn things around in Canada. So would you tell us about the diplomats they sent over and what their mission was? Seeing that the, the military strategy was really not working out, the revolutionaries called for diplomatic assistance in the early spring of 1776. And a team of three was sent up. Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Now, he was a Roman Catholic educated in France, so he could talk to the locals. Samuel Chase was a lawyer so he could deal with legal worries that people might have up here. And then, of course, there was Ben Franklin. 
Franklin had the wherewithal to send a printer ahead of the diplomats with instructions to produce pro-revolutionary propaganda in French. Now, this fellow's name was Fleury Méplé. He was a Frenchman whom Franklin had met in London and to whom he had recommended Philadelphia as a place to set up his print shop. A year later, Franklin is back with them in Philadelphia telling him, go to Montreal, print stuff for us. Now, Benedict Arnold was back from Quebec City when the diplomats arrived. And remember, the Chateau Ramsay was the headquarters of the Continental Army. So Benedict Arnold hosted a reception for the American diplomats at the Chateau Ramsay. Unfortunately, the revolutionaries had bollocked up the job so very badly, and by June 15th, it was time to leave. They all made it back over the border, except the printer. He couldn't afford to leave his printing equipment behind, and he also couldn't afford to take it with him. Like the other revolutionaries, the only money he had in his pockets was Continental Script, which no one would recognize. And by this time, the locals were so fed up with the revolutionaries that nobody would help him for free or otherwise. So the printer ended up being arrested by the British and put in jail. When they released him as harmless, he started up a pro-revolutionary newspaper. Not the smartest thing to do. That got him thrown back in jail. When he was released the second time, he started up another newspaper. This is in 1778, and that newspaper still exists today. Founded by Fleury Méplé during the American Revolution, it is Montreal's last remaining English-language daily, The Gazette. What role does the Chateau Ramazay serve in the present day? I mean, what will we see when we come on our next visit to Montreal? Well, when the French Fur Trade Company got booted out of Canada after the conquest, the Chateau served as the office of the governor of Canada. It served as a courthouse, a school, even a university, the first French-language university in Montreal. And then, believe it or not, in the 1890s, it was unused and slated for demolition. It was saved by a club of amateur historians and collectors called the Antiquarian and Numismatic Society of Montreal. They created the Chateau Ramsay Museum within the building's walls in 1895. Through the building itself, the hundreds of historical artifacts that it houses, and through its staff and volunteer guides in period costumes, s'il vous plaît, the museum focuses on the history of Montreal and, by extension, the history of the province of Quebec, of Canada, and bits and pieces of the American history that we share. My favorite room, by far, is the original kitchen in the basement, partly because it has the most amusing cooking aid ever devised. Very high-tech for its day. My second favorite space is the French-style garden that occupies the museum's backyard. It's only one-sixth the size of Claude de Ramsay's original garden, but it does give a hint of the magnificent space that de Ramsay and his guests will have strolled through. Now, among my favorite items in the permanent exhibition is a De Dion Bouton automobile dating back to sometime between 1898 and 1903. It's the first automobile to have been given a registration number by the Quebec government, the equivalent back then of getting a license plate. I also like the magnificent portrait of Ben Franklin and the note that he and his fellow diplomats wrote in Montreal to secure the safe passage of the wife of the man in whose house Franklin had stayed while in Montreal. These uh, last two items are in a room dedicated to two of the three times that the United States tried to capture Canada, namely the American Revolution and the War of 1812. All right, Bruno, I think you need to tell us a bit more about this intriguing kitchen device. So what is it? Why is it so technologically advanced? Well, imagine a large kitchen fireplace. Right? It's larger than the fireplaces that are used to heat a room. This, this is used for cooking. In front of the fire, you will have a spit, the, the long, thin rod on which you place the meat to be barbecued. And because that spit needs to turn, otherwise you'll have burnt meat on one side and raw meat on the other. 
at some point, somebody devised the cleverest device to turn the spit and allow the human staff to carry on with other duties. You see, the, at the end of the spit is a pulley. The pulley links to a pulley on the side of a barrel that is inset into the wall above and to the right of the fireplace. So when the barrel turns, it causes the spit to turn. Now, the very clever part is how you make the barrel turn. Visitors at the museum will assume possibly water-powered or maybe even air-powered that heat from the fireplace somehow is sent toward the barrel and that the, the hot air makes the barrel turn. But no, it's much simpler than that. The barrel is a dog wheel. You place a dog in the barrel, close the door, the dog does its best hamster impersonation, causing the barrel to turn, and that turns the spit. And because the dog turns the spit, the breed of dog is called a turn spit or a turn bull. Medium-sized dog, short, crooked legs, loves to run. And the surname Turnbull originates from some of the first breeders of this particular breed of dog. Wow, that is really neat. You have told us about what we will see at Chateau Ramazé, and there are so many wonderful objects and artifacts there. But it has been listed by UNESCO as one of the 1,001 historic sites everyone must see before they die. Why do you think, why is the Chateau Ramsé on that list? Well, it's one of the oldest buildings in Montreal. And Montreal is worldwide an important city. The Chateau Ramsé is one of only six buildings left in old Montreal that date back to the French regime. And it's the only French governor's residence left in all of Canada. The French governor of Montreal lived there. The French fur trade company operated out of there. The British governor had his office there. The military commander of Canada during our revolution, downgraded to the rebellions of 1837-38, was headquartered there. And the list just goes on and on. The Chateau Ramsay is the belly button of Canadian history. If the list of 1,001 historic sites were pared down to a list of 10, the Chateau Ramsay would still have to be on the list. Wow, it is a very impressive historic site. Now it is time for the Time Warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. back to the American Revolution. In your opinion, what might have happened if the Americans had held Montreal in 1776, if they could have repaired their relations? Do you think Quebec would have become the 14th state of the United States? The key would not have been in holding the city of Montreal. It would have been in taking and keeping the city of Quebec, because whoever controlled Quebec City controlled access to the interior of the continent via the St. Lawrence River for whatever reinforcements would be coming, whether they be British or American. Now, assuming the Americans had this control, Canada would have become the 14th state in the Union, but it would not have lasted long. The French population tolerated the English government thanks in large part to the Quebec Act of 1774, which guaranteed them language, religion, and land ownership systems that they were used to in the days of New France under the French. Any attempt to alter any of that would have had dire consequences for the government. Benjamin Franklin made it clear that the United States was to be English-speaking, not French. Protestant, not Catholic, and would have proper land ownership, not the quasi-feudal arrangement that was the seigneurial system inherited from New France. Carrying through with this idea would have put the population of Canada against the United States. 
not carrying through with this idea would have put the population of the United States against its own government. It would have been a no-win situation for the Americans right from the start. And Franklin wasn't the only one. Most of the colonists in New England also would have resisted Catholicism or the French language. And we can see that in the way that they protested. After the Boston Tea Party, England passed several acts to punish them. They closed the port of Boston. They limited town meetings and government meetings. And one of the acts that was not even part of the acts to punish New England, but the New Englanders took it so personally, was the Quebec Act. It was like, oh my God, you're going to let the Catholics hold office? And they they had a big issue with it. So it's very interesting to see the perspective you put on that. It sounds about right, I think. Before we conclude, would you tell us whether the Chateau Ramazé has any other special events or educational programs we should be on the lookout for when we plan our visit? Oh my, it's a long list. In addition to the permanent exhibition on the history of Montreal and a temporary exhibition, currently it's on the 1st Military Regiment in Canada, the museum stages uh, several seasonal activities, such as period military and other demonstrations in summer, a pumpkin-themed exhibition in the garden every autumn, and a special exhibition during the holiday season, the Christmas-themed exhibition. The museum also offers school tours, hosts children's birthday parties, and the building and garden can even be rented for special events such as weddings. So if any of your listeners want to come up to Montreal and get married, they can rent the Chateau. Fantastic. And where's the best place to look for more information about the Chateau Ramsay and how to plan our visit? Oh, in the 21st century, where else? The best place to find information about this 18th century building and its current offerings is online at chateauramsay.qc.ca. Fantastic. Bruno, thank you so much for sharing the early history of New France with us and showing us the intertwined nature between Canadian and United States history. You're most welcome. Many books and articles would have you believe that Canada almost became the 13th state in the United States. However, when we look at the historical record, and we read the letters from the diplomats and soldiers on the ground, they confirm exactly what Bruno just shared with us. Most Canadians did not want to join the American Revolution. As for the Chateau de Ramazé, I highly recommend a visit. I had the opportunity to visit the museum last September during my French and Indian War tour. The museum had a lot of great interactive exhibits and discussed a lot of the history that Bruno shared with us but in a lot more detail. It was fantastic. In fact, it was so good. This is why they're on the show. I wanted to bring the museum to your attention with the hope that the next time you have the opportunity to visit Montreal, you'll stop by and visit that fantastic museum. You can find more information about the Chateau de Ramsay, their special events, and how to plan your visit by visiting the show notes page for this episode, benfranklinsworld.com slash 041. And while you're on the website, you should also consider signing up for the Franklin Gazette newsletter, which will not only deliver the show notes for each week's episode into your inbox, but it will also give you access to Poor Richard's Club, our social community for Ben Franklin's world listeners. 